A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast. To my shame, I say that we were too weak. But what anyone dares to boast of, I am speaking in foolishness. I also dare. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they children of Israel? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I am talking like an insane person. I am still more, with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, far worse beatings, and numerous brushes with death. Five times at the hands of the Jews I received forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I passed a night and a day on the deep, on frequent journeys, in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own race, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers among false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many sleepless nights, through hunger and thirst, through frequent fastings, through cold and exposure. And apart from these things, there is the daily pressure upon me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is led to sin? And I am not indignant. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The word of the Lord. From all their distress, God rescues the just. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be ever in my mouth. Let my soul glory in the Lord. The lowly will hear me and be glad. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us together extol his name. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Look to him that you may be radiant with joy, and your faces may not blush with shame. When the poor one called out, the Lord heard, and from all his distress, he saved him. Dominus Fobescum, Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum, Mateum. Jesus said to his disciples, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and decay destroy, and thieves break in and steal. But store up treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor decay destroys, nor thieves break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there also will your heart be. The lamp of the body is the eye. 
If your eye is sound, your whole body will be filled with light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be in darkness. And if the light in you is darkness, how great will the darkness be? Erbum Domini. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, a number of years ago, <clears throat> there was a holy old Jesuit priest, and you know that there are difficulties in the church when Dominicans quote Jesuits in homilies. There was a holy old Jesuit priest who had spent most of his latter years hearing confessions all day in the St. Ignatius Church in San Francisco. And he was dying. And as he was dying, all the younger Jesuits gathered around his bed, and the superior asked him, Father, what is the greatest gift that you have received in your life? And knowing how people are today, he looked around the room and he said, Father, the greatest gift I've received in my life is final perseverance. The readings today speak to us of perseverance. Perseverance in the Christian life, perseverance in the Catholic life. Paul talks about all the things he went through in order to preach the gospel, and he calls this boasting. Now, most of us would boast of our successes. Paul basically boasts of his weakness, and when you look at all the things he went through, my goodness, he says, you know, he got what, 40 lashes less one in the Roman Empire, the maximum number of lashes you could get is 40, but they used to do it less one just in case they miscounted and gave you an extra one. 40 lashes less one, many times. He suffered all these things, also his positive qualities. What could he boast of if he wanted to? He could boast of his lineage. He was not only connected to Abraham, but he was a Pharisee. He was considered a very important member of the Jewish community. And yet none of this made any difference to him. Because the important point was that the whole reason we live here on earth, where is our treasure, as Jesus says, it has to be in heaven. Because we have an intellect, because we have a spirit, in the face of both what we consider our material advantages, and many of us have many material advantages, or our weaknesses, we can't keep our eyes fixed on either one. We have to realize that perseverance is not something that we can merit. No one can merit perseverance to heaven. It's a divine supernatural gift because heaven is eternal. It's rather something that we have to depend constantly on the Lord for every day. Every single one of us is like a child holding onto its parent's hand, exploring the world. And once we forget that and think we can persevere on our own, then we're in for trouble. The unfortunate thing is that today, the whole culture, all of our ideas about truth, all of the things that we hold to be dear, our educational institutions, are all based on the idea that we can solve our problems on our own. Very little, few times do you hear people reference depending on God. And yet somehow when they do, it's always for something, not always, but often for something strange. You know, in my order, every time there's a note that goes up on the bulletin board, and it said, after much prayer and reflection, you always know what the next sentence is going to be. I've decided to leave the order in the priesthood. Apparently, much prayer and reflection never leads anybody to stay. And the reason is because they do things like they say, well, you have to go with your gut, and that's God's will. Really? People have gone with their gut now for the last 40 years. I think it's called the feeling revolution. Believe me, I know all about it because I was raised in California in Berserkly in the late 60s. People discovered feelings and then truth became determined by feelings. And once that happens, we become blind to what the purpose is for which we live in this world. Jesus talks about this today. He talks about the eye being the lamp of the body. Now, he's using here an analogy you could say in morals, the eye is like our intelligence, which teaches us the truth. 
and our feet are like our will who brings us there. It doesn't suffice just to see that you're supposed to go to this place. Suppose I was thirsty and I saw the water and I said I want to drink that, but I never got up off the chair to go get it. Well, that wouldn't be sufficient. On the other hand, if all I did was walk around with my eyes closed, am I going to actually ever be able to find the glass of water to drink the glass of water except by accident? Pope Benedict has recently written a letter about the crisis in our church in which he explains that it's caused by the dictatorship of relativism and the feeling revolution that led to a very peculiar idea of what morals involves in us. When people talk about our moral difficulties today, they often want to talk just about correcting bureaucracies. Well, whatever happened to saying these things are sins, don't do them. They actually can. We don't want to preach fire and brimstone all the time, but it can lead you to hell. I remember I was counseling a woman. I knew a woman. She was a very fine person. But because of the accidents of her life, she couldn't bear a child. And she couldn't adopt one either. So she was fertilized in vitro. And I said, you know, you, you can't do that. It's a sin. And she looked at me kind of contemptuously. And she said, well, do you really think God could send me to hell for something like this? And I said, well, it is a possibility. You know, you have to consider the possibility because it doesn't conform to the truth. And that what happens is our disjointed loves going with our gut all the time, determining truth or God's will according to that, begins to lead us to, now I don't know about what your eyes are like, but mine are not very good anymore. And it begins to lead us to having our eye, which should be the lamp of the body, which should teach us the truth, our conscience, being somehow deformed what appears to be good is actually evil. What appears to be evil is actually good in a person who has a malformed conscience. Recently, someone in authority in our church said, well, you always have, the priest always has to help the penitent follow their conscience. I said, really? If I have someone whose conscience tells him he should fly a plane to the World Trade Center, am I supposed to help him buy the plane? I mean, it's true, our conscience is the ultimate norm for the, the law, for God's light in us, but it has to be correctly formed according to the truth. And nobody seems to ask the question about whether something's true anymore. There was a book that was written in the 80s. It was called The Closing of the American Mind. This book was about secular education, and it basically stated that in universities today, nobody asks whether something's true or not. They ask whether it corresponds to the popular culture, especially now everything's, am I safe by listening to this? I never have to challenge myself. I never have to realize that there's something beyond my own small little version of the world. Perseverance then demands truth and it demands a commitment to relying constantly on God's grace. And today, sometimes people find it difficult even in the church People ask me, well, why would you stay in the church with all the things going on in the church? Is it worth it? Well, again, is it worth sailing the ship through the troubled storm-tossed sea in order to get to port? Is it worth keeping my eye fixed on the fact that despite the fact that we have very weak members in our church and people that sometimes are evil, that the sacraments are here, that our doctrine is here, the Christ structure which he gave us is here. Sometimes the structure may not be perfect in the way it's exercised, but it's still there. Where else would you go? What we have to do is pray, first of all, that we'll be able to get through the blindness of our eyes, the, you know, the whatever clouds and smokes our vision so we can't exactly see clearly, to keep our eyes fixed on the final prize. And the final prize is heaven. If we can't do that, both the moral weaknesses which we have, the moral weaknesses which other have, the physical difficulties like death, challenges like this, are going to lead us, well, to be green troops, to run away at the first invitation to battle. And you know, the church isn't the only place where people are weird, inept, and incompetent. 
Think of all those generals during World War I that sent those millions of people to die on trenches for a few yards of ground because their tactics hadn't caught up to the weaponry. Just imagine, I think in the Battle of Verdun, in two weeks they killed a million men because everybody was throwing them against machine guns. Well, I mean, machine guns hurt, you know, men can't stop bullets like this. And these hu poison gas, these huge guns, and yet the generals were convinced all they needed was more men. Just keep sending out more men. Instead, what we have to realize is that our treasure, despite the weaknesses, the reason we call it the church militant, is because it's the church in suffering. It's the church in battle. The church that hasn't attained the prize of victory. And just as in an ordinary human battle, some of the commanders are competent and some of them aren't. Some of them can melt away at the first sign of distress. They don't have a lot of intelligence about how to prosecute war. In a similar way, sometimes in our church, we need to realize that we're still on the journey. We have to keep our eyes fixed on our Lord. If you want a good example of that, today's feast is an excellent example. Like St. Paul, Aloysius Gonzagas, merit to, you know, he, he was born into a noble family. He had all the advantages of life. And yet, like St. Paul, he chose to give these up at a very young age in order to serve Christ. This led him, at a very young age, to participate in caring for some victims of plague in Rome when he caught the disease and died. He's therefore considered the patron of youth, among other things. Listen to what he says. We read this in the Office of Readings today in a letter to his mother. Take care above all things, most honored lady, not to insult God's boundless loving kindness. You would certainly do this if you mourned as dead while living face to face with God. One whose prayers can bring you in your troubles more powerful aid than they ever could on earth. And our parting will not be for long. We shall see each other again in heaven. We shall be united with our Savior. There we shall praise him with heart and soul, sing of his mercies forever, and enjoy eternal happiness. When he takes away what he once lent us, his purpose is to store our treasure elsewhere more safely and bestow on us those very blessings that we ourselves most choose to have. Prayer is what's necessary for perseverance. When St. Thomas in his Summa asks if we can persevere in grace, he says, not by our own power. We can't merit it. But he ends that section of the Summa by saying, what cannot be merited can always be prayed for. The fathers of the desert used to say prayers all day long, like we say the rosary, two verses of a psalm, in order to pray for perseverance each day. Today, in the Latin church, we begin the divine office with them. And this must be our prayer, too. Oh God, come to my assistance. Lord, make haste to help me.